19 years, I was GA Investor's boy. And um, then for about three years, I started having some pretty good revivals, and I became Anthony. And then in 1972, I, I married Mickey, and I became Mickey Mangan's husband. So there's only been about three years that I have been myself, but I'm, I'm working on that. But she's anointed vessel, sang at the governor's uh, inauguration last month, and it was so anointed of God. But that's not what has really gripped Mickey in the last few years. I've watched her passion. And uh, she started a seven ministry here with uh, addicts. And uh, I've watched her care for broken people. All of us with our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups. If there's one ministry that consumes her, it is our addiction ministry. They have between 80 and 100 every Saturday night. She's now started a Monday night class and a Wednesday night class where they run 60 to 7 those nights. Helping people. AA now sends their people here. I thank God for Mickey and her passion that God has given her. And that's, it's really swung and amazing in her ministry to which I'm, I am thankful for. And she'll speak to you today for 15 or 20 minutes. And then Brooke Pamer, what an outstanding young lady. It's Mike and Debbie's daughter and uh, we helped raise her. But she is going to speak from the standpoint of some of what Terry was talking about here of the balance of her life and the things that she and Paul has faced in raising their family and passing this church. I think for the next 40 or 50 minutes, the hurt and the pain that's in this place is going to connect. And I believe if we take communion today, there's going to be great healing in our hearts. Jim Blackshear spoke for us uh, Sunday night. He talked about 24 years ago when right here he was coming from Jackson College of Ministry and he knelt here and a man spoke to him and said go back to Alaska with your father and he said I really didn't want to go back to Alaska but he said I went to prayer and God said go work and follow my father and he said I went up there and started doing a fishing business and then I worked into pastor and he said for about the last eight or nine years he said all the hell turned against us he said in heaven I went through so much pain in that church and the infliction that it was coming on us. He said it was almost unbearable. He said, and then two years ago, he said, I came back and Brother Mike Williams preached on, after he wasn't here and all those surgeries and things he was going through, the lame shall take its prey. He said, and I found myself at the exact same spot 24 years later, just like Jacob, Bethel and El Bethel. He said, and God did a marvelous healing in my life to which I am thankful for. And I believe today there's going to be a mark in a preacher, preacher's wife's life that is just going to touch you. And before we leave this place, when we take communion, the blood of Jesus Christ and his body is going to strengthen us. Would you help me welcome Mickey as she comes to the pulpit today? much. You may be seated. Thank you, Anthony. Birth order plays a pivotal role in the personalities of children, and I'm the middle kid. The firstborn is usually the leader and the role player and more likely to take positions of responsibility and ex excel in education and very dutiful. They have high standards and they're prone to worry. And the last born or the baby, they're charming, they're center stage and manipulative and disorganized completely and um, innovative and um, rebellious and uh, friendly and they challenge authority and they are the angel of the world and we, us, we're just kind of <sighs> 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 
considered to be um, neglected, you know? We, we have no drive, we feel like we don't belong, and uh, we're least effective, <laughs> so... Uh, we're not bold, we're least talkative, and we're complexic, and we lack self-esteem, and we're not gonna risk rocking the boat. So they've developed a syndrome for us. Now a syndrome is a condition that's characterized by a set of associated sy symptoms. It's, a, it's an illness. <laughs> it's a disorder, it's um, an affliction. We're, we're sick. Because somebody, somewhere, perceived that uh, even though we are swayed by other opinions, we at least do have some good social skills. Hence, I am here this morning. <laughs> and even though we hate and despise conflict, we can get in between it and we can negotiate it. And even if things are blowing up in our face, we can put up our hands and we can say, now come on now, this is not too hard. This can be fixed. We, we can do this. We can do this. We're realistic. We're realistic about this. You know, and there's times when we, we, we can excel, we middle kids, but it's just in very unacademic ways. So Mick, <laughs> what are you gonna talk about this morning? Actually, I think it's just gonna be a story. I'm trying really hard to challenge the story structure of this just one thing. This one kind undertaking a, a singular journey, just one. You know, Hollywood is the king of making one hero stories, and in the end, only one conquers, and then they alone take a selfie on the top of the mountain. Actually, in the everyday narrative of our lives, there are other people. Other people. We middle children as appeasers, we don't like to leave anybody out. You know, we share a lot, which makes us incredibly vulnerable, particularly vulnerable, a costly yet a very small price to pay to be able to interact with you, to exchange, to negotiate together. We're family, and families stick together. I know that I don't bring a lot into the table Just little pieces of a broken heart There's days I wonder if you'll still be faithful Hold me together when I fall apart Would you remind me now of who you are That your love will never change There's healing in your name you can take broken things and make them beautiful You took my shame and you walked out of the grave So your love can take broken things and make them beautiful I'm better off when I begin to remember How you have met me in my deepest pain so give me glimpses now of how you have covered all of my heartache with all your grace remind me now that you can make a way your love will never change there's healing in your name you can take broken things and make them beautiful you took my shame you walked out of the grave so your love can take broken things and make them beautiful you say that you turn my weeping into dancing remove my sadness and cover me with joy you say your scars are the evidence of healing and you can make the broken beautiful make it beautiful your love will never change there's healing in your name you can take broken things and make them beautiful you 
took my shame and you walked out of the grave so your love can make beauty out of ashes. So it crashed to the floor in about 10 pieces and I just knew it couldn't be repaired. You know, my brother and I were used to being alone. Mom and dad pastored a small church in uh, Iowa, Knoxville, Iowa. Dad drove a school bus and mom worked in a restaurant in an auction barn and, and it's the, not a car auction barn, it was an animal barn. Yeah, livestock, thank you. She worked in that kind of an auction barn. And uh, we were babysitters to our younger sister, Tanya. And, and we just ran out of things to do, okay? That's all I can say. We just ran out of things to do. We played chase in the house. We played chase on the furniture, walking from piece of furniture to piece of furniture. If you touched the wall or if you lost your, your balance and you fell down on the floor, you lost. I mean, you, you lost. You lost the game. And we'd get out on the roof through the open window and we'd see how far that we could walk up the incline without losing our balance and slipping. We were bored. Jimmy actually fell off the roof on his head onto the ground and I, I believe that's what's wrong, but I, I, I don't know what made us do it. I don't. I don't know what made us do it. We were bored. So there was this piece of pottery that had belonged to our mother's grandmother, Granny Anderson, an Illinois Indian, beautiful little lady, and I'd give anything for it today. We played this game because we were bored. We, we played this game because our parents were working. We played this game because we were left at home with our baby sister. We, we played this game because our parents were building a church in Iowa. So we'd take the piece of pottery and we'd throw it to each other, knowing that it was a valuable piece. And, and we'd take a step back and then we'd throw it again. And then, and then we'd take another step and we'd throw it back and, and uh, whoever was the last one to take a step back, they lost. They lost. Well, I was the middle child, so I took the blame when it fell. Mom cried in the kitchen when she didn't think that I was watching. I couldn't even say, I'll get you another one, because there wasn't another one. And besides, I was only like nine. I remember picking up the broken pieces and I tried to piece it back together. And if, had I just known of maybe a procedure or something, I could have possibly had it mended. The story of my life includes people. I love community. I love vibrant community. I love the way that we do church. I love because of the times. I love Sunday morning. I love Sunday night. I love Monday night with seven. I love Wednesday night with seven. I love Wednesday night church. I love Saturday night with seven. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's people. I love people. I'm the middle kid. Gotta love. And because I love, there's times that I have to hurt. But you know, when I've encountered situations and difficulties in my own life, too often my initial approach has been to work really hard at being strong because I have to pull together the hurt and the happy, the with it and the with the, without. And I like to think of myself as being sturdy and dependable and fit, so fit physically and mentally and spiritually again the middle child bridging the gap. But I have found over 60 years in the process that even the best of my strength is no match for the many, many challenges and hurts of life. I've been broken and so have you. Here is truth. 
Just because we've been broken doesn't mean that we have to be thrown away. For some reason in God's world, we become more valuable. We can be crushed through rejection, misunderstanding, betrayal, abuse, all leaving us as though we just have no world or no worth and it's all gone. But God uses those avenues in which to speak truth and to inject reality, to draw us to him. Because why? Because why? Because he requires us to be contrite, humble, broken. It's his way. God operates on a wholly different value system than we've been accustomed to. He's interested in our eternal character. And it's of my opinion that one of our greatest fears is that we will suffer for no reason. That tears won't make a difference, so why cry? And certainly don't cry out loud. And that if brokenness overcomes us, we have no value to anyone else. I think it's our society that has done this to us. We just don't seem to be an honest people because we tend to play cover up so very, very well. We throw away broken things. Pain is a nuisance, it's pointless, it has no meaning other than just being an inconvenience. And the scars of life, the wounds, the deep lines, the weaknesses, all have stories to tell. Yet often we try to hide them away, preferring instead to present to the world that I have conquered and here is my selfie to prove it. In Japan, they've made an art out of restoring broken things. It's an ancient practice called King Chui, meaning golden repair or golden healing. It's an age old custom. They repair cracked or broken pottery with gold dust powder or with real gold. They're expensive. Not only fixing the the break but greatly increasing and enhancing the value of the piece the story which takes several people to tell the story the heart of it is all of this turning what is broken into beautiful cherished pieces by sealing the cracks and crevices with lines of fine gold. Instead of hiding the flaws, the King Shui artists highlight them, creating a new design. Behold, behold, I am making all things new and bringing unique beauty inwardly and outwardly to the original piece. While most normal repairs of broken things hide themselves, disguising themselves with this super glue, our intent is to make it look as though it never happened. Don't we try? Yet the fine art of King Shui reinforces a profound belief that enhancing the broken and scarred makes it even better than new. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I, even I will make a way in the desert and in the wilderness. I will. It's often in the moments of deep suffering that we notice that we were made 
for more. There is purpose. We have a healer, one who repairs. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds their wounds. His amazing grace and love makes us become his workmanship. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And that is my story. Bringing life to what was broken and sharing it with people. He makes the broken beautiful. Please don't despise your pain. Don't waste it. It's damaged people who bring hope to the world. My daughter is dying. That is my unvarnished truth. That is the pain we carry with us every moment of every day. On Friday, September 28th, 2013, our world fractured. A routine ultrasound done at 20 weeks revealed that at first glance, our daughter's brain appeared to have no brain matter at all. After further review, a specialist informed us that she had a condition called hydrocephalus. More simply termed, she had water on her brain. The pressure from the increased amount of cerebral spinal fluid in her brain had pushed almost all of her brain matter to the margins. And for nine weeks, every week, my husband and I walked into an ultrasound and looked at our baby's brain, waiting with bated breath for the technician to say, wait, wait, all is well. Your child has been healed. I, I can't explain it, but, but it's all gonna be okay. But week after week after week, the news got worse, the pressure on her brain increased, and finally at 28 weeks, we could wait no longer. And so on January 7th, 2013, our deepest pain and our greatest gift came wrapped in the same package. Grayson Yale Hamer. Amazing Grayson. She entered our world and I can truly tell you it will never be the same. Her arrival overshadowed our other life-changing event that happened that day. You see on January 7th, 2013, according to a previously arranged schedule, we also began serving as the senior pastor of Apostolic Church in Barberton, Ohio. We began our journey of pastoring and parenting a special needs child all on the same day. On January 8th, her second day of life, Grayson had her first brain surgery. 
A shunt was placed in her brain to relieve the pressure, and the early MRI results indicated that her brain, like a sponge, would begin to expand, and to borrow the neurologist's words, she could lead a fairly normal life. I got mad when he said that. None of my children were going to be fairly normal. We were going to be exceptional. We were going to beat the odds. After all, we have God on our side. But on Easter Sunday, just several weeks later, Grayson had her first seizure during the church service. And family pictures from that day, her hand is black from where she gripped it so tight as her body began seizing. Just one day later, April 1st, 2013, our world truly shattered into a million pieces. That was the day that a doctor looked at us and told us that our daughter's brain was severely malformed. My mind raced with the things that she might never do and looking back, the list seems comical. You see, I, I went straight past the she'll never walk and she'll never talk. I, I, I got caught up on my baby girl's never going to get married. She's never going to drive a car. She's never going to graduate college. She's never going to know what it feels like to be filled with the Spirit of God. I'm never going to see her go down the water and be baptized in Jesus' name. It seems silly, but, but my healthy daughter died that day. And I left her behind in that emergency room. Grayson had three brain surgeries that first year. Her epilepsy escalated, and we found ourselves in the emergency room, often with a baby who had been seizing for hours. We have seasons where the right cocktail of meds control the seizures, but eventually a new one manifests and the cycle begins again. Outside of a miracle, Grayson's development will never surpass three months. For two years, we took her to therapy every single week. And at the end of two years, she had made very little, if any, progress and the therapist looked at us and said, I don't think you should bring her anymore. There's really not anything we can do for you. She hears very well, but her brain does not allow her to process vision correctly. We aren't sure what she sees. It seems that lately she almost always has an ear infection or a sinus infection. It has become common for her to sleep up to 20 hours a day. She's not able to control her body temperature. She will frequently drop below 85 degrees, putting her in a hypothermic state. She suffers from severe sleep apnea. We are told that she could pass away at any time, but that she could also live to be as old as 10. And no one can really narrow that spectrum for us. In 2015, she began vomiting, and for four months, she vomited several times a day, and it would often take us over an hour to feed her a bottle, and then she would vomit, and we would start again. And every doctor had a different diagnosis, but we eventually learned that she was aspirating and refluxing. She was going to require a surgery that we were not sure she would make it through, and we spent the first part of our summer in a hospital preparing ourselves to say goodbye to our little girl. And we spent the second half of our summer learning how to live with a child who has a feeding tube. These are all facts. I can give you the facts. But I feel ill-equipped to give you my feelings my pain. You see, how can I transport you to that terrifying moment 
When your baby lets out a blood curling scream and your heart drops into your stomach as you watch her body buck and contort uncontrollably and somehow with tears running down your face, you have to keep it together enough to medicate her so that you can stop the seizure at home and after you look in the eyes of your eight year old and tell her baby it's really okay, you all get dressed and go to church because it's Sunday morning and you have to sing and teach and smile and shake hands. You have to help someone. You have to see past your own pain and see someone else's. How can I depict the sinking feeling I feel in my stomach every time I get in my car and drive to the hospital? Or how can I tell you how it feels on a daily basis when I listen to my daughter stop breathing and I have to pat her on the chest? to remind her to start again. How can I measure for you the level of frustration I feel when I ask someone to do something at church and they tell me they're too busy? How can I capture for you the constant guilt that plagues me, that I'm not doing enough for the kingdom of God because I'm so busy trying to stay out in front of the wave that I feel like is constantly in danger of swallowing us whole. Can you understand my fear that God can't make sense of my prayers? I pray for him to heal her, and then I pray for his will. I pray for him to heal her, and then I pray, God, Take her peacefully. Do you know what it feels like to pray for God to take your child? Because it's better than having to watch her suffer. What would you have said when your seven-year-old daughter asked you why her baby sister doesn't walk or talk like other kids, siblings do? How can I capture for you the heroism of my husband, who I know goes into Grayson's bedroom every morning before he leaves, not just because he wants to check on her, but because if she's gone, he wants to find her first. How can I paint the portrait of Grayson with mere words? her strength, her endurance, her sweet nature. How can I get you to feel the explosive joy that we feel every time she smiles or laughs? She just started laughing last month. <laughs> She's never done that. <laughs> All is right with our world when Grayson laughs. How can I explain to you that your heart can be shattered again and again and again, and sometimes, somehow, you can still laugh? Somehow you can still hope. Somehow you can still believe. I know two things. I know that my daughter is dying, but I know that my God is faithful. I said, I know that my God is faithful. We haven't been singled out. We are not unique. At the point of their creation, Adam and Eve were undefiled by any evil. 
unblemished by any disease or defect, unspoiled by any imperfection. Together, they were very literally the flawless examples of male and female excellence. They were inhabitants of God's garden where trees sprung up that were pleasant to sight and good for food. Rivers flowed for the sole purpose of just keeping everything hydrated. God's creative prowess was on display. Adam and Eve, first man and first woman, living in a world without pain. But with one bite, sin slithers its way under the door of paradise, destroying innocence, and humanity holds its breath, awaiting God's verdict. And it is in his punishment to Adam that God curses the ground and declares to man, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Man has fallen, paradise is lost. Sin shifted the narrative and now humanity must face adversity. Now we must feel pain. We haven't been singled out. Thorns are a part of our human condition. We can be broken now. We can be scraped raw. We can be shattered. Now, we need a savior. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul prayed for his thorn in the flesh to depart from him. And God said this, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul said, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That word rest means to take possession of or to literally fix a tent over. When we glory in our infirmities, God pitches a tent of power over us. I said when we glory in our infirmities, God pitches a tent of power over us. I'll prove it to you. Meet Chuck and Patty Hunter. God calls them Grayson's angels. And I must admit, I often expect there to be a halo over their head. The hunters began attending our church almost a year before Grayson was born. And they will now tell you that they feel God brought them in part to care for Grayson. And they do. And when I leave her in their care, it is very literally the only time I do not worry. God sent them to us before we even knew we needed them. Because God pitches a tent of power over us. Taking care of your granddaughter or your niece is not supposed to include administering medications or operating feeding pumps, cleaning stomas, or spending hours in hospital waiting rooms. But God gifted Paul and I with parents and aunts and siblings that carry us because God covers us with a tent of power. He pitches a tent of power over us. Our eight-year-old daughter, who is the perfect blend of sass and joy, has never had one moment of bitterness or jealousy. Sitting in the ICU this summer after Grayson's latest surgery, she said, Mom, God must have known we were a special family because he gave us a baby who he knew would need special love. And all I know is that in the storms of sickness, God covers me with a tent of power. A week doesn't go by that we don't get stopped in the aisle, get a card in the mail, a text message from a precious saint of God wanting to know how our baby is doing 
wanting us to know we are covered in prayer. When I sit in church on Sunday, I look around and take stock of the faces that weren't there three years ago, lives that God has touched and changed in the middle of our pain. Because no matter how life storms, no matter the lightning and the thunder, God covers us with a tent of power. I want you to hear me when I say that the very next time I hit my knees, I will ask God to heal my baby. The very next time I'm in a service and God's healing power begins to move, I want you to know that I will make my way back to that back pew and I will pick that baby girl up and I will walk her to the front and we will pray for her and we will lay hands on her and we will petition God for a new brain because I still believe in a God that heals. Even if he doesn't heal for me, I still believe. And that's because God has covered us with a tent of power. The truth is I'm not any different than you. We all have our seasons of pain. Your pain may have a different face than my pain but we can all be scraped and broken we can all be dropped and shattered and yet still we go on we strive to do the work for which he has called us thorns are a part of the human condition but hear me when I tell you, your pain can deliver your promise. Your pain can deliver your promise. As Abraham scaled Mount Moriah and those thorns surely scraped at his heels, little did he know that if he could just reach the top of that mountain, those thorns were holding his miracle. Abraham's pain became Abraham's promise. And so it is for us. Those very thorns that were seeded in Eden to bring us pain brought us promise when they were crushed into the brow of a savior. That fateful day in history when Jesus was nailed to a cross those brash Roman soldiers laughed as they crafted that crown of thorns and crushed it into our Savior's brow. They, they thought that the thorns were just a weapon of convenience, but they missed the Savior's message, our pain in Him always becomes our promise. Jesus was our ram in the thicket, our spotless lamb. There is no pain he has not felt. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. David said, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and he helped me. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. David said, nobody's gonna get me down. I'm gonna glory in my infirmities. I'm gonna rejoice, I'm gonna sing because there's a tent of power that is available to me that God will place over my life. I don't know who you are today. I don't know what you're facing. Maybe you walked in here with something that nobody else even knows about. I don't know how damaged you are. I don't know how depressed you are. I don't know if you're scraped or broken. 
if you've been hurt by a backslidden child, if you've been shattered by sickness, are you disappointed or discouraged? There's a promise for you. It's waiting in the thicket. And if you can just keep climbing up that mountain, if you can just take to him your thorns, he promises, my grace is sufficient for thee. If you will glory in your infirmities, I will pitch a tent of power over you. I don't know if you're hurting. I don't know if your faith has been shaken. I don't know if you came in here thinking God is not going to move in my situation. I don't know if you're sick of praying over and over and over again for something that God just seems not interested in doing for you. I don't know. I don't know where you are, but I know this. He sent me today to tell you that God wants to pitch a tent of power over you. So if you're hurting, if you're broken, if you're shattered today, I think it would be okay as we walk to the table of communion, if from side to side and front to back, we just lifted our hands and let God overshadow us in this place if you're hurting don't leave this moment without letting God do for you what he has promised don't leave this moment without letting God come and hover over you in the storm of life he wants to be your shield no matter how hard it's raining no matter how hard the pain is hurting God wants to cover you today he wants to overshadow you today Oh, he wants to be your shield and your strength. Oh, he wants to come in and lay himself over you and infuse you with power and strengthen you and increase your faith and give you hope and bolster your belief that anything is possible in him. Oh, don't leave this moment without letting him do what you want him to do in your life. For this is your moment. This is your ram in the thick moment there is a promise waiting for you there is a promise waiting for you in the midst of your pain I don't think there's anybody in here that's not in in pain I looking at a sweet couple that that is a part of a group that Mickey and I meet with and They've been through it with a building program. They've been so broken in this service. Uh, Mick and I have our issues. Um, I'm sure the Bernards have their issues. I'm sure everyone on this platform has got their own family issues. I just think right now, God would like to heal right now. So could we just, maybe not totally like last night, but could we just sort of start pouring our heart out before we take communion of, say, God, I give you my brokenness right now. Go ahead and just, just speak it right now. God, I came in here hurting and you're the only one that can help me, oh God. And I, I, I hand it off to you. I, I give it to you, God. It's, it's, it's yours. It's, it's bigger than me, God. Heal, God. You sit us off as we take this. When we take your blood today, healing's going to happen. You're going to start picking up some shattered pieces, and God, as those pieces that 
Mickey show today, God. They're going to become beautiful. Came in here with so many shattered things. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be beautiful. Our hearts, our pains, we give it to you, oh God. We're in a totally different service now than last night, God, and you're, you're healing right now. You're healing right now. Some, God, years of hurt all the way back in our childhood, God. Things that happen, scars that are there. You're healing right now, God. We prayed about this. We felt so strong about this service and you've invaded this place. Oh. get in a hurry right here. Please just don't get in a hurry right here. Listen to the voice of God. Please don't get in a hurry right here. Let him heal. Let's hear his voice. brokenness right now. Let the healing rain of heaven begin to fall in this house. As soon as you begin to feel that healing come, I want you to stand and begin to receive that healing. 
when you feel the rain of heaven beginning to begin to fall in your life and your family i want you to stand and receive that right now in the name of jesus let healing begin to fall in this place nobody may know your story but he knows your story in fact he's writing your story he's the author and the finisher of your faith if you'll surrender that story to him and allow him he's going to finish it it's a glorious story it's a beautiful story. Let him finish writing the story right now. From your brokenness, he's fashioning something beautiful, something powerful. I have questions. Communion. Communion will be passed. Um, those of you that uh, do wine for communion, it is uh, in the balcony. It's at two stations. But listen closely. We have further instructions because the bread is in the packet. So even those of you that take wine on the bottom floor, it's behind the cameras but you will still need to take a packet for the bread, please. If you would pass these as quick as you can, our ushers are ready to go. Take one out and we'll be prepared for communion. Ooh, in my moments of fear, through every pain and every tear, been faithful to me when my strength was all gone when my heart had no song still Faithful to me.